Now, in what was Einstein's golden year, 1905, was the year when Einstein published five important papers that changed the course of physics. Now, one of them, which he called On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, Einstein argued that time was not absolute. So when you're analysing motion, time is relative, but rather the speed of light has to be absolute. So he argued that if we start off with two key postulates, there are certain consequences. First, that the laws of physics are invariant in inertial frames of reference. Now what that means is that if you're not accelerating, then the laws of physics don't change. And the flow on effect is that you can't do an experiment that will verify whether you are moving or whether you're not. And the second postulate is that the speed of light is constant in all frames of reference. Now, in other words, that means no matter what you're doing motion-wise, no matter what light is doing motion-wise, the speed at which you measure the speed of light will be always the same value, 300 million meters per second, or commonly known as C. So what are the consequences? Well, first of all, that time dilates, momentum also dilates, length contracts, and then there's this concept called simultaneity. Now, in this video, I'm going to discuss what time dilation is and the evidence that confirms that Einstein was right. So stay tuned. Now, in my previous video on relativity, I discussed how Einstein came about the idea of relativity. And I also introduced Einstein's thought experiment on the train. Now, I'm going to take that thought experiment and slightly modify it. Let's see again Einstein on the train, and he's traveling on the train that's traveling close to the speed of light. But at this time, we'll place a mirror on the ceiling, and with a light source, he measures the time for the light to go up and down. Okay, now let's look at the same event from my perspective on the side of the track. The light indeed does go up and down, but also left to right from my perspective, and so the path length is clearly longer. Now, to help with the math just a little, Let's just look at half of the journey, since the time for it to travel upwards will always be the same downwards for both our perspectives. So let's have a look at a diagram of the situation. So here I have Einstein, and Einstein is sitting, of course, on the train, and he sees the light path going upwards. I, on the other hand, because he's moving across my path, will see the light path travel that amount. And then, of course, we also have the train, and if I just look at the train, then I get that path. Normally, what we would say that the time it takes to go directly upwards is going to be the same as the time it goes across. But we can't say that because time dilates. So let's have a look at the mathematics. So I'm going to move this vector here of Einstein's uh, measurement of time. And what we're going to do is we're going to start labeling a couple of things onto our diagram. Now, reminder is that these are all displacements. So in essence, displacement is always going to be equal to the velocity of the object that you're measuring multiplied by the time it takes. But in this case, although the displacements are clearly different sizes, the t's we can't assume to be the exact same value. We're going to have to therefore identify two different t's. The first thing we're going to do is Einstein's perspective. Now this distance here is equal to the velocity, which is c, which is the speed of light, multiplied by t, and we're going to make this called t naught. This is called the proper time. There's nothing special about proper time. It just means it's the time measured in the same frame of reference as the event. So in this case, this is Einstein who's measuring the light in his frame of reference, and so therefore T naught is the appropriate label we give to it. Now if the hypotenuse is how I observe that light, so it's still the same speed. I see C, but the T is just going to be just T, because it's my time that is not in the frame of reference of the event. And then finally, of course, the train. Well, the train is going to a certain velocity, and then finally the time is the what I measure it. So now we have a nice right angle triangle and I'm going to put all of these variables together and so we end up getting CT all squared is equal to CT naught all squared plus VT all squared. And now I'm going to multiply everything out and I'm going to put the VTs or the Ts on one side of the equation. I can now isolate t squared by putting it outside and I get c squared minus v squared. Outside, I get c squared t naught squared. I'm now going to divide both sides by this particular part here. So I get t squared is equal to c squared t naught squared 
all over c squared minus v squared. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide the numerator and the denominator by c squared. And of course, I'm, what I'm really doing is dividing it by 1. So I'm going to get t naught squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now, of course, this is t squared. So now, I, of course, I can get t by itself. I get t is equal to t naught divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So you can see now that this variable down the bottom here determines the dilated time. The proper time will be one value, but this number down here will always be a number smaller than 1, and therefore t will be greater. Or another way we can say this is that t is equal to some function of 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, like so, multiplied by t naught. Now this thing here is called the gamma constant and it's going to come up a few times when we look at relativity both in terms of momentum dilation and also length contraction and it ties in with a concept called the Lorentz transformation but that's a subject of another video. Now if I look at the formula again I want you to appreciate something. Most things that we measure in terms of speed is a really small value and so therefore this particular section here will be ending up very very small indeed it's because c squared is the speed of light squared so this value here in essence is almost equal to zero. So in other words t and t naught practically are the same. That's why we don't see relativity effects in normal life. But when objects are traveling really really fast as in closer and closer to the speed of light this starts taking some significance and we're going to see that in a moment with the muon. So what evidence exists for time dilation? When Einstein wrote his paper the technology just wasn't available to test his assertions but that changed in the early 40s and again in the early 60s. Now muons are subatomic particles that are created by interactions of cosmic rays with the upper part of the atmosphere and they were first detected by Carl Anderson in 1937. In essence, they're actually like an electron but only much more massive. Now muons have a very short half-life. So although many are produced in the upper parts of the atmosphere, the number reaching the Earth are greatly reduced. They decay before they get to the surface. In 1940, Rossi and Hall, working in the mountains of Colorado, discovered, at least qualitatively, that the half-life of the muons was longer than expected depending on what altitude they were. And then in 1962, in a really critical experiment, Fritsch and Smith were examining the flux of subatomic particles that were created in the upper parts of the atmosphere that we now know as muons. So what did Fritsch and Smith do? Well, as I said to you, muons are created in the upper atmosphere and they will travel through the atmosphere and at some point stop. That is, they'll decay at a certain distance. Now, randomly this occurs and they may decay maybe at this point. Some may decay at this point and some may actually travel all the way before they decay. But generally speaking, over time, you're going to get an average of a decay where you're going to get less and less uh, measurements of muons the further and further you close get to Earth. Now, what did Fritsch and Smith do? In a famous experiment, they measured the decay of muons at the top of Mount Washington, which is approximately two kilometers in height in the state of New Hampshire in the United States. And they were able to slow down the muons enough so they actually can observe their decay. And through many trials, and they measured basically about 560 muons decaying per hour on the top of the mountain. In other words, 560 muons were detected. Now, knowing the amount of muons passing through the atmosphere is relatively constant, they then predicted that by the time they reached to the ground, there would be significantly fewer muons to measure. So then they took their experiment downhill and went to Cambridge in Massachusetts, where they repeated the experiment. And they predicted that less than a sixteenth of that amount should remain. But what they discovered is that 422 arrived here at Cambridge, Massachusetts, significantly more than if they allowed for the, the distance here of approximately 2,000 meters. And so determined that the half-life of the muon was significantly longer. And this was attributed to the fact that the muons were traveling close to the speed of light. In essence, the clock of the muon, that ticking in motion of its half-life, could slower from my observation. Now let's have a look at the maths. 
So our formula for decay is equal to t is equal to t naught over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now a paper published in 2007 showed that the velocity of the muon is approximately a value of 29.8 centimetres per nanoseconds. Now what does that equate to? That ends up being around 96.3% the speed of light. So we're going to use that in order to determine what the half-life is as measured from our frame of reference. So we're interested in t. Our t naught, the, the measured half-life at rest frame of a muon is 2.2 microseconds. And then we do this, the square root of 1 minus. Now the number is a fraction here for v. So if we put 0.963 multiplied by, of course, a c, over c and of course both the top and the bottom are squared. Now the good thing is is that you can see that this c squared cancels out with this c squared. So you end up getting 2.2 microseconds over 1 minus 0.963 all squared. And of course that's the square root thereof. And when we calculate that out we're going to get a value of 8.195 microseconds. That's approximately 3.7 times the rest half-life of our muon. In other words, the muons seem to survive a longer time because they're traveling at 96.3% of the speed of light. Now this experiment was seen as a validation of Einstein's prediction of time dilation. But there's another famous experiment and it's called the Hafiel Keating experiment. So what Hafiel and Keating did was design an experiment to test the validity at least of time dilation. Now to be fair they were looking at both time dilation due to motion and also due to gravitational time dilation which is about general relativity. So what Hafiel and Keating did was charter a jumbo jet. Now I have a plane here, it's one of my toy planes from my childhood and that's not the type of plane they flew. They flew a, a 747. And what they did was they flew around the world with a cesium atomic clock. Now they keep time pretty well. You might have one second drift in 100 million years. So if you have these clocks and synchronize them, they would stay in the same time. You would not get any differences simply by the way of their working. And so they were able to measure times three times. First of all, they would have a cesium atomic clock that is obviously stationary relative to the surface of the Earth. Now, of course, that is also moving relative to a fixed frame. Then they would fly in an easterly direction. Now, that means that the speed of this atomic clock on the plane is traveling faster than the speed of the clock that is sitting on the surface of the Earth. But then after they bear the times, so they flew also in a westerly direction. Now again, because this is now traveling in a westerly direction, the speed relative to fixed frame is now the slower value. So they would have a slow value, a middle value, and of course a faster value. And we're going to see those results. They predicted that with the eastward journey, they would lose about 40 nanoseconds, with a margin of uncertainty of about 23 nanoseconds. And what they got was 59 nanoseconds with an uncertainty of 10 nanoseconds. That's well within their predictions. When they were looking in the westerly direction, they predicted a gain of 275 nanoseconds with an uncertainty of 21 nanoseconds. And they observed 273 nanoseconds with an uncertainty of 7 nanoseconds. Again, extremely good results and verified time dilational effects. So in summary, Einstein, by starting from his two postulates, built a model that predicted time would be measured differently depending on the relative motion of the observer. Now this was subsequently tested by two famous experiments, as we've discussed, that tested this model and that evidence validates Einstein's model. Now, they're not the only experiments that have validated time dilation, and I will provide a list of experiments for you to research in the description below. Now in my next video, on relativity, I'm going to be looking at other predictions mentioned, so keep an eye out for those. Remember to like the video if this has helped you and subscribe hitting that bell to be notified for future releases. My name is Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.